now have the privilege of welcoming Emrys Goldsworthy. Emrys is based in Brisbane and has owned and operated clinics for around 15 years now, as well being the senior lecturer for the Department of Muscular Skeletal Therapy. He has written his own method known as the Goldsworthy Protocol for Manual Therapy and Rehabilitation. Emrys was one of the early adopters of shockwave therapy and has a very different but revolutionary method on on how to utilize a shockwave, uh, which has been proven to be quite effective, especially for those clinicians who have done his courses before. Um, he personally uses a gymnast shockwave as his machine of choice and has had a machine for around eight years now. So he has a massive amount of experience uh, with this particular treatment modality and other treatment modalities as well. Um, yeah, Emrys to you. Well, good, ne good evening, everyone. Uh, let me just, whoop. all right. So tonight we're, doing through, we're going through some special cases, special kinds of ways of using shockwave. Last time we predominantly did tendons and, you know, that's a general focus on early shockwave courses. Tonight really is about expanding the use, right? And there are some really important notes to make using shockwave. Shockwave in, in many ways should be quite different to anything you've used before. In, uh, some of you might be using laser, low level laser like myself. Uh, it is far more, you've got, to, you've got to have a protocol and an approach that essentially is not gonna harm the patient. You've really got to get to the point where you're not being too invasive too quickly. You've got to go in slow and build up. That's very important. And I think that in general, that works for most ways of uh, treating using manual therapies and, and even rehab. We're going to go through the spine first, and there are very, very important notes with the spine. Okay. So I'm going to start with shockwave treatment in the cervical spine. And I've divided it up into upper and mid-lower, right? Now, most people treat the spine in a three areas, upper, mid, lower, so cervicothoracic. And the lower you go, the more force you can use. And partly the, the main reasons is just because it's more fragile in the upper cervical, although we've obviously got to be careful when you are applying something like shockwave to the cervical. Uh, it's the same as when you would apply manipulation. You've got to have more care the higher you go. And so that's how I would approach it. There's a special applicator that's used for upper cervical and mid, uh, the, um, the Atlas attachment applicator. So we'll be going through that towards the end about that applicator. There are other types of applicators that are have like this shape so they're shock waving two points and they're used in the thoracic and lumbar predominantly and those can, those are very useful for a specific ways of uh, mobilizing joints okay i'm going to be talking about the use of a single um, end pro, um, applicator and how you can use that in different directions different angles okay so the most neck problems we're dealing with a patient that comes in with a restriction or pain or restriction and pain. And it tends to be mechanical. Most neck pain, people will come in, they'll turn their head and they get pain normally on the same side. That's the sort of most common thing you'll see. And we might say, oh, it's a facet joint. It's a this, it's a that. Okay, well, it depends what school of thought you have. You know, there are different schools of thought and how to approach the neck. Some of it's all to do with malposition. Some of it's all to do with stability through range. Some of it, you know, there's lots of different approaches. This should apply to all of it. So I want to say that if a joint uh, is in some ways stiff on passive assessment, if you are assessing the neck, and it has a resistance to it, its motion to say the right or to the left, because often what you'll find is if it hurts to the right, that segment doesn't move to the left. 
that's a really common thing. Uh, C1, C2, C3, whatever it might be. Let me just admit this person. So often what I'll do is I'll work to improve its rotation away from the direction that it hurts in. If it hurts to the right, and I'll tend to want to mobilize it in the opposite direction. Now that's all relative to how much passive motion it has in the directions. And I always go for the direction in which it's limited in. Okay, it could still be limited towards the side of pain. And that's when I would use the opposite side. So take that as a note, okay? I'm using the idea that a joint is not moving enough in a certain direction, okay? And that's how we're gonna apply shockwave to affect motion. This is a little bit how like the, um, there's a thing called an activator that chiropractors use. That tends to be how that's being used. It's used to engage a direction of force. And the shockwave can do the same. It will engage a joint to move in a certain direction and mobilize it in that direction. If you use Mulligan's technique, which is a, a technique where you hold a joint in a certain direction, you put force and you get the patient to move. You can actually use shockwave in the same way. If you use Maitland's technique, which is to mobilize a joint in a posterior to anterior direction or a um, posterior to anterior medial direction or a transverse pressure, you can actually do all the same things with the, with the shockwave. Yeah, obviously, care must be taken because if you're not skilled or not uh, used to doing it, you've got to start probably in the thoracic, somewhere where it's a very rigid area where it's far safer uh, and you've got to know your anatomy. No surprise, right? So shockwave, uh, generally speaking, if someone comes in with neck problems in rotation or lateral flexion or whatever it might be, think about the direction in which they're limited and at where does that joint need to go to improve that range of motion in your method? For me, with a right rotation restriction and pain and pain being in the upper cervical, let's say at C2 that I've decided is not rotating to the opposite side, so when I go to the right, it hurts, it's, it, it gets um, guarded and painful. I can apply the shockwave at a very low bar. And this is why we've mentioned low bar, low intensity, low pressure, because we want to make sure that we're going in soft and gentle. We don't want to increase their pain. We want to just increase their range of motion. Okay. That's the number one aim. And that, often results in less pain. And if we can do that at a low grade without having to increase the force, then we're doing things in a very efficient and uh, also just more elegant way of doing it. You don't have to go in hard, okay? Start with a low intensity. So three to five bar over the segment using the Atlas applicator. I've indicated here anteromedial direction over the facet joints. So that would be from that facet joint where the point of pain is, there's our facet joints. And from the back, we're pushing it with the shock wave that way and a bit this way, a little bit medial. Okay. So it's going in on a slight angle in. Okay. And that will glide the joint away, the opposite way. Okay. If you want to get a bit more intense, you get them to turn away from that direction of pain that is limited in that left side rotation. And you get the applicator on there with the rotation and then apply the applicator. You're going to look at doing um, low intensity, like I said, but also not too many shocks in one go. I would start with about 200 shocks, 200, 300 maybe. Over the segment, reassess. How do you feel now? Oh, I'm getting worse. Okay. You'd have to cease treatment at that point. Like with anything, if a technique is making the patient worse immediately, that is a clear sign that you need to move on to something else and understand why is that making them worse? Then go through your diagnostics again. Okay. But let's just say they are uh, say, mm, not much better, but not worse. Okay. We'll keep applying. Or they might say, I'm getting better. It feels better. Good. We'll keep applying. Same principle. And it might be that you can then, if they're not that much discomfort, 
you increase the bar to one, maybe 1.5, you can go higher uh, within pain limits. We don't want to cause that much pain. Just a little bit of discomfort's okay. It's uncomfortable, but not, ow, it hurts. I can't, ow, no, we don't want that. We don't want that guarding feeling because that's just not going to assist in the recovery of the patient. They're going to turn their head and we can apply it um, anteriorly from the back over the segment that is not moving. I'm just repeating it over and over again because a lot of people can get confused about this. Okay. And I, I just really want to reiterate it. Now, another thing that can really help is applying it over the nerve roots. Now, some people get scared about applying shock wave over nerves. I wouldn't be scared at all. I do it all the time and it's where I get my most success. Okay. I will say that I work predominantly on nerves 95 percent of the time I'm I'm manipulating shock waving or lasering nerves that's it that's what I do nerve entrapments nerve mobility problems that's how I look at the body and then the other things are tendons tendinopathies traumas to uh, tissues and trying to help them repair and joint alignment problems okay sometimes I'm using shock wave to initiate some increased collagen deposit deposition to basically stabilize it. That's a burgeoning field of research where you apply shockwave to stabilize over time. A little bit like how you might use prolotherapy, but we're early days in shockwave and using it in that way. So coming back to this, I'm going to tangent a lot so that there's some context. Using the Atlas applicator for the upper cervical spine, you can amend and assist in the change of a neck rotation deficit and pain by applying it on the same side more often than not. Sometimes it's the opposite side, only when there is a restriction problem in the direction of which you're replacing it, okay? Always go with restriction. You can then apply it over the nerve roots. So the nerve roots are lateral over the transverse process area and their mobility and tenderness is often the problem as well. As the joints move, the nerve roots get pulled. And if they've got some inflammation and irritation or they're sticking to a structure, it could be a disc, could be as they exit through the foramina, could be anywhere, could be a fascia, could be things, anything. Those structures can get in the way and they pull and they cause pain and guarding even elsewhere. They may not be even local, but it hurts to touch over those transverse processes. Those those nerve roots is what you want to go for, okay? And you can use the Atlas applicator over them and you can go side to side, okay? Up and down. Um, those, uh, you've got to do it in very small doses, about 100 shocks. And then I move it around those points, medial from side to medial in a side to side motion. A bit of skin pull is useful as well. Sometimes you pull on the skin as you move it and you move it forward over that segment. And you actually get some side to side motion of that nerve root, which helps the movement of the neck. It can also affect the, those kinds of nerve root pains you get with lateral flexion towards the side of pain. Okay. If you work with necks a lot, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you can also, um, work from the back, uh, sorry, I was just reading my notes. Anteriorly for over the spinous process. If you want to increase flexion of a segment, you can actually do that by using the same applicator. You go into flexion and you apply the applicator from the back straight line down the line of the facet joints so that the facet joints glide. And I'm applying the shock wave from the back over a segment. I'm going to go quite low intensity and we're giving it a bit of a force forward just to get in a glide forward and deflection. That's for flexion deficits. Okay, so I just wanted to mention this um, uh, bit of research. So I, for all of these slides, I'm going to talk about research a little bit. I won't bore you too much, but you've got to know that there is some research out there that's worth noting. There's more, obviously. I have, this is not exhaustive. It's just uh, a small snippet, snapshot. Okay, so um, this paper uh, used ultrasound guided shockwave. Uh, and you don't have to do that if you know your anatomy, but they did for osteoarthritis, spondylosis, and nuchal ligament calcification. Okay, and I use shockwave for uh, osteoarthritis all the time in the neck. Same principles apply. Okay, uh, but you can apply the shockwave 
um, over the areas that you found on the MRI to be degenerated, okay? So they found that the shockwave groups had greater improvements in range of motion and function compared with the rehabilitation heat pack group. So we know that rehab is a mainstay of therapy these days, but uh, you know, if you, if you read a paper that shows that shock, uh, something, so shockwave in this case, is better than rehab, you've got to stand up and, and take notice. I just want to, hang on a second. That's all right, we'll just keep going. Um, hey Wade, I just wanted, can you let me know how we're going for time? Um, if, if we've got like, I might ask you soon, uh, once I get to my, my last few slides, uh, because I, have, I can't see my clock on my computer because of the way I'm presenting. All right, so we're gonna do thoracic now. Uh, same rules apply, okay? You can be a little bit more forceful here and start using the D-actor, um, which is a wider head. Um, same, same angles, I even use it on ribs. Uh, so if you look at this picture of the ribs attachment points, we have our, the heads of the rib attaching onto the costovertebral joint and the costotransverse joint. Of course, you're not gonna really differentiate them that much, but applying it as it touches that costotransverse joint on that rib angle, you can actually mobilize that rib. Now, there are lots of nerves that often run over that, that segment there, over that rib part, the portion of the rib, and often you're treating the nerve, not really the joint. And that's where a lot of confusion is. People think that they're mobilizing the rib and they're actually just pushing on a nerve on the rib. There are obviously signs where it is just the rib, okay? We consider the use of this in the same way. Um, if a person has rib pain, they tend to have pain twisting towards that rib and on breathing and on coughing and things like that. Obviously, you can use shockwave on fractures. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, and so it's not like contraindicated if, I, if you have a patient with a rib fracture, but you've got to come at it differently when it's a fracture. When it's a rib problem, meaning a malposition or irritation in those joints you've also got to consider what are you trying to achieve right well if you're trying to improve motion in that joint well you've got to go towards that joint posterior lateral or posterior anterior posterior to anterior angle with that shockwave okay all right so that's how i would apply it to the thoracic you can um, angle it in any way depending on the restriction all right Look at your segment and consider as the 3D, right? If this is the uh, spinous process, if it's restricted this way, I'm going to shockwave this way to push it into the restricted motion. motion. Makes sense. And you're always applying it from the back. You're not obviously in the thoracic arm, you can't, well, you could do in the lumbar and anterior approach, but you won't do that in the neck. It's, it's unnecessary. Generally, I would only ever apply it from the back towards the side of restriction, okay? You don't want to um, mess about uh, with new angles that just aren't generally used by clinicians, okay? Particularly when it gets to, too close to arteries and things like that. We just don't know, you know. I mean, I apply it through the SCM quite often, uh, but I'm not messing about heaps through the carotid artery, you know? I think that's logical. Okay. Uh, now, I want you to think about where you would use this in your own clinical practice, what kinds of pain you're going to get in the spine, what kinds of restriction. A scoliosis patient, that could be a great example of when you would use it in lots of different restriction types with them because it's going to be different no matter where you're on the spine, different directional restrictions. Okay. Now, you can use also shockwave in a way that initiates some kind of change in the structure, right? Degeneration, I've mentioned that, so segmental degeneration, but also you might have osteophytes. You find a scan, it shows osteophyte buildup in that spinal segment at this point, and you see it on the X-ray, it is up to your judgment as to how you're going to direct the shockwave over that, over that um, calcification and osteophytes. Okay, and you can break down some of them. Depends how, how um, hard they are, all right? 
most of them can be quite chalky and uh, easily broken down and are not that painful to treat. But it really is a question of, is that really a problem? Is that um, osteophyte really problematic for that person? And do we need to treat it? Okay. All right. TMJ. So TMJ is a, an interesting one. It's not one that a lot of people realize that they can use shockwave. And in fact, um, don't forget a lot of patients in treating the neck will need to have protective ear wear, um, headphones just to um, take them from the sound, the noise. It's very loud. So I myself wear um, ear protection often. Depends, you know, a lot of it's to do with how close it is to your own head. Uh, the noise, the vibration can disturb people in their head. And I, I should also mention that shock waving in this region can initiate a cough reflex. And you just need to know where your patient's reflex is initiated. Sometimes it's in the, the kind of trap area. Sometimes it's in the scalene area. Sometimes it's in the neck. Sometimes it's lower down. For some reason, those different points um, initiate so the cough reflex in one person, but not another. Very odd. But uh, the coughing, you'll get patients that will cough. They'll be like, <laughs> I've got something in my throat. It's from the shockwave. The shockwave, and it doesn't last. None of it lasts. It's just a, a reflex that's been initiated. Okay, just be aware of it. All right, so the TMJ, the TMJ, there are numerous problems that are relating to TMJ pain whether it be just general muscular pain, tooth pain, right? could be referred pain, the teeth, uh, joint pain locally, headaches relating to TMJ, jaw problems like locking in the jaw or clicking and things like that, like derangement. This can be very useful. Uh, for derangement, I find that it, it's early days as to how we can use it for derangement. Uh, but I, I suspect that from my experience using it on a clicking jaw, it's very effective. But uh, I haven't seen any research yet on derangement. But on, as you can see here, we'll talk about the research. There are, there's research done on inflammation and cartilage degeneration. So there, there's, there's other kinds of problems associated with the derangement that you'll find it has been shown to be effective. So derangement is just where the disc has moved out of alignment in essence, okay? So it can be used in lots of different ways over musculature, but I tend to predominantly use it over the TMJ itself, right here into the joint. Now that's very close to the ear. So you, you need the hearing prote hear protection, but you might actually need them to wear, like put in a, um, uh, any kind of um, in-ear protection okay rather than the big um cans or something like that and just need something in here um because it's very difficult to treat the jaw while they're on that's my experience okay so i have uh for new patients i i get them to i just buy some from the shops and have them there ready to go okay uh going from lateral to medial the same rules apply as a cervical. Trying to increase range of motion and I'm trying to increase blood flow locally. I'm trying to increase cartilage deposition change. And I'm also trying to reduce inflammation. Okay. Like I would with laser. And it's very effective. In fact, for cases where you might think they're not able to be helped, you know, most techniques don't work. Joint mobilization techniques don't work very well. Intraoral techniques work a little bit. And I, I don't say you shouldn't do that. I do them all the time myself. Lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid, things like that. Intraoral. Uh, soft tissue techniques like that. Um, I don't shockwave inside the mouth. Shockwave outside. So for outside, I would apply shockwave over the joint. Do 300 shocks get them to open and close, maybe grit their teeth, whatever hurts normally. Okay, it might be when they chew. So when they bite down, you want to retest that again. And very quickly, often they will feel less pain and it will happen within those first three to five hundred, uh, 
300 to 500 shocks. Then you can apply more. The question is when you stop and how do you change from treatment one, two, three, four, five, you know? And most of the time you've got to apply the rule, um, do it enough to change it at least 20% if it's improving. If it doesn't improve in that session, but doesn't get worse, do max 2000 shocks on that, on that jaw. Okay. Don't do more than that. And then see how they go at 24 hours or 72 hours. Okay. And they might improve then. Some people improve days later. They don't, they need the days to get better. This treatment is short. It is not very long. It does not take very long to do, but I do a lot of other techniques. So sometimes if I'm just doing shockwave, it would be like minutes, a couple of minutes done. If, and then I add laser and I add some other nerve manipulations and soft tissue techniques as well. But the shockwave, very minimal time. And I do believe though that shockwave alone is a, it's the majority of the result. Everything else is just to enhance it, okay? You can add in rehab. You might be doing some pterygoid strengthening, masseter strengthening, um, superhyoid strengthening, you know, all sorts of things people use with rehab of TMJ. Okay. So all of those things apply. All right. Uh, I also use it over musculature. You can do it over the temporalis, but don't forget that the temporalis is right over bone and, and that can rattle the brain a little bit. So I don't do it there so much. I mostly do it on the masseter using the, the Atlas or the D actor. And you can just brush through that um, masseter muscle from the back all the way through a few, like about 500, 800 shocks. Within their limits, I wouldn't be getting up to the two bar. I mean, you can, but it'd probably be about the one to 1.5 bar. It wouldn't be more than that that masseter and you you probably could even do scm uh i can see a role for using that then okay um yeah all right um now the, the research that i've listed here is only some of it uh but basically um, shockwave was associated with a protective effect on cartilage and subchondral bone uh in tmj osteoarthritic patients uh, these are, this was actually an animal model in the way that they did it. So they, um, it still applies. It's very important. I, I know I don't always list human models rather. Uh, this is a rat model, but it does help us to understand the underlying mechanisms of why it helps. All right. So this, this cell change, this, you're going to start to see some improvements in x-rays and MRIs. That's what I've seen personally. It's anecdotal, but that's what I've seen. Things look different. You know, after your, your fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth visit, a few months into it, people's scans look different. They look much improved um, if they are getting regular um, shockwave. Okay. The other one that I've listed here is um, they've used ultra shortwave uh, compared it to shockwave therapy for TMJ. And so shockwave significantly reduces pain and improves the function indices of um, temporal mandibular joint and mouth opening. Um, TMD, uh, TMD, which is temporal mandibular um, disease, uh, patients. Um, so basically, compared to the ultra wave, as an example, in this, I don't know why they used that, but that's what they compared it to. It outperformed it. Okay. Experience though for me is that it works consistently. And reasons as if it wouldn't work might be that that patient has a lot of inflammation there and shockwave won't cause an immediate change in inflammation. It takes hours and days to result in improvement in, shock, in inflammation. Okay. So you don't always get an immediate change. Okay. But it does work consistently but always work holistically and consider all potential sources of pain, not just where their pain appears to be. Okay. Pediatric conditions. Now I've listed 
two types as, a, as an example. Now, this can be used on children. I've used it on as young as four or five. Um, they find it pretty cool. It's just noisy. You know, it's not invasive for them. And most of the time, it's fine. Uh, I, I find it to be actually quite uh, surprising how well kids tolerate it. And a lot of kids are dealing with growth plate problems, inflammation, tears, abnormalities, those sorts of things. So I've, I've, I'm going to talk about growth plate abnormalities and apophysitis, which is another growth plate type of problem. So I use it consistently with ostrich slatters, severs, um, other examples might be ASIS apophysitis, um, AIIS apophysitis, um, any apophysitis really, where the bony eminence, the growth plate at that bony eminence is inflamed or damaged. Okay. And you would apply it as you may well presume directly over the point of pain within their painful limits, building up over time. If you can only do 0.5 bar or one bar with a de-actor, fine. You're still going to get change. You'd be surprised how much they improve with a very low intensity. Now, I do want to get higher within their pain limits, and then they want to go a bit higher and higher over time, over the different sessions. And it can be applied on multiple different directions. So let's say it's the tibial tuberosity, where all switch ladders is. As that bony eminence comes out and the attachment of the tendon, you can go around that bone either side, either direction, going medially, uh, sorry, going from lateral to medial or medial to lateral, um, inferior to superior, okay, or from above. You can go straight on it, but I find that it's better if you go from the sides of the bone, okay? Point and shoot. It's not to, within reason. Point and shoot is the principle. Where does it hurt? Go there. Okay. That tends to be where the problem is in that um, growth plate. You can also get growth plate diseases at the ends of long bones. Okay. Like tibia. You also get it in fibula. Uh, you can get it in the femur. Uh, I was recently dealing with a patient that had inflammation on the growth plate on the distal tibia and fibula. And he was about 14. And uh, he had some growth and then he had increase in load with his soccer and both sides hurt um, from more like more than 30 minutes running. Okay. It was exactly over that growth plate, tenderness to touch. Shockwave, I applied it laterally, medially left, um, and over both uh, where it hurts. Okay. Where it hurts. I also use laser which I find very effective with kids. Um, I think that laser and shockwave, but laser particularly gave me a lot more options, like a lo lot more conditions I could treat with laser because they don't feel it. It's a cold laser and it's effective for treating pain and inflammation. Okay. But shockwave, very fast acting. So this boy, he came in with pain that was stopping him from playing uh, and he was playing um, about four times a week, had a couple of games a week, quite active, right? Um, and he found that he got improvements immediately that week, first one. Third, by the third one, he was completely pain-free and he was able to do full sessions, full games, no symptoms. Now, that's not going to be every player. That's, it could be six, seven or eight, even. Um, he just didn't take that long. He was had a good diet, good lifestyle factors. Everything was uh, in line. So he really didn't have any reason not to get better. And he had a good head on him, right? So he was, uh, I gave him some rehab as well, some strengthening for his lower extremity. Um, there was some stability problems there that could load up that area. And uh, he worked on that as well. So I don't just shockwave off and give it rehab plan as well. Uh, you know, the same rules apply to severs. Often it's a very similar mechanism to ostrich ladders. You know, people, severs is this heel um, attachment where the Achilles is coming in and that part of the bone's pulling off or is inflamed. 
and that's an x-ray. So that growth plate is where that um, space is between the bone and the calcaneus. So that area is um, also often to do with excess load with, that st with, with reduced stability in the lower body. Could be hip, knee stability, not just ankle. And overloading it due to a deceleration deficit, problem with deceleration tends to be that in running. Not always, but it, it's mainly that. So once we improve their deceleration, uh, you know, strength and how they land and they're running, you know, uh, often that's a factor. Depends what they sport they play and what they do. Rehab what they do. That's what I'd, I consider. What do they do as, a, as an exercise? And I rehab that. Okay. Um, so direct it towards the pain. Okay. So looking at um, some research, so a pilot study was done and demonstrated that radial shockwave uh, is a safe and promising treatment for adolescent athletes with recalcitrant oscillators. So oscillators is not responding to treatment. Another one found our preliminary experimental results suggest that shockwave may serve as a non-invasive treatment and possibly a safe strategy to stimulate longitudinal bone growth. Okay. So these were applied to rabbits, another animal study, but again, the way, what they're testing for afterwards, often you can't do it in humans, okay? For ethics reasons. So it looks good. So far, so good. And I've had very good success, good success with it. And I highly recommend it. Okay. All right, fractures. So look, not everyone sees a lot of fractures. Uh, I see a lot of stress fractures and I see a moderate level of non-union, you know, malunion fractures. These fractures uh, is what people tend to seek treatment for. Acute fractures, most people get in the, the cast and that's all you see, right? I do, I have treated acute fractures successfully and I believe have, have made the time of, to heal much faster. I've shortened that period, okay? Stress fractures are often a bit longer, depending on where it is, to keep its high load, lumbar, tibia, that kind of thing. And I deal with a lot of ballet dancers as well. I'm being an ex-ballet dancer myself. And I treat a lot of ballet dancers, but also runners. You see it in them as well. So stress fractures as well over the medial tibia. Uh, it could be the anterior tibia. Um, it could be over the navicular. It doesn't matter. Consider where it is apply the shock wave in the same principle of which you would apply it over the TMJ, very much low intensity within painful limits. And you can literally do it over the fracture site. If it's too painful, even at the lowest intensity, you can do it along the bone elsewhere. So above and below, so that that vibration of the shock wave is going through the whole bone. I've seen improvements just from that uh, when I can't apply it directly. Another thing I do often when I can't apply it directly is use laser and that can really reduce the pain significantly even within the session enough so I can use the shock wave. So that's, that's an example of where I might use another device. Uh, so what I would find is that though, one of the biggest successes is that male union, non-union type. And I've listed some examples there of types of uh, non-union. Um, now, when there's a huge space in the in that uh between the bones i don't expect it to fix that okay say like a defect i don't i don't see the role of shockwave to do anything about a huge space between bones necrotic bone i don't see that very often at all but i can see a role um these first two and uh, this atrophic, these ones are the ones I'm mainly seeing where it's just not fully forming. Um, it's not, the bone is not continuous. There, sometimes the bones are just sort of, they're not meeting, they're malunion like that. They're not touching, they're just veering off and they're, they're trying to connect this way. And shockwave does work. And I've seen it work in um, forearm, I've seen it work in uh, distal fibula for that example. 
um, sometimes even in the clavicle, although I do sometimes it's really useful for them to go and put it because of surgery um, when it's uh, very out of alignment because it really will affect shoulder motion, you know. But I, you don't want such a big defect in the region, okay? okay. So I wouldn't just jump on shockwave over a possible more advantageous surgical approach. But I do apply it and I do apply it with success and I find it consistently and always successful. But again, that's my experience. You're going to get cases where it doesn't work, no matter what it is, no matter how good the therapy is, shockwave being what we're talking about. Many times it will not work, particularly if you have many, many with that condition, you're going to get more obvious numbers that aren't, it's not working. But when you have a moderate to low number, which most manual therapists in the field of physio, chiro, osteo, whatever, my, we don't get a lot of fractures. It's just not what we do. You'll see it more in the medical side of things, doctors and, and hospitals, right? But we should. If you've got shockwave, you've got an option, and it's a very successful option in my opinion. So in this paper, they found that um, shockwave treatment, especially for delayed or non-healing fractures, is proving to be reliable, safe, and highly effective treatment overall. Glowing report found in this paper, 2021. I've tried to make every paper at least the last couple of years, sometimes a little bit older, but they're all pretty recent. And there are papers from ages ago as well. So, all right. Now, when you're treating, also consider the other sources of pain. So all the same rules apply, all right? So consider the nerves in the region, some of the change in the musculature that might be impacting on that bone. But you can apply it directly over the site, distal or proximal to the site if you can't locally. And you can apply it about per site. 2,000 is generally enough. 2,000 shocks at their pain limits. Okay. Often you won't go past 1.5 bar. You're probably going to start low, 0.5, 1, 1 bar. And you don't have to hold it on one spot. You can move it up and down the area, in and out of the painful site. Okay? Very effective to do it that way. All right. Wounds. Well, again, it's very medical, and uh, I will shockwave patients who have this, but people don't tend to sort me out for it. As many of you would, would not be the case, that they would sort you out for wound treatment. But uh, if you do want to promote it in your clinic, be aware that you're going to need to have some things. You're going to need to have some protective, protective covering, something that is of a plastic um, dense material that can be applied and is obviously uh, um, has been, um, is used specifically for bandaging, okay? So don't use anything else, you know, tissues and all that. Don't towels, not proper um, dressing. Okay. And make sure it has some thickness to it. If you can, um, you can get it from most pharmacies, not a problem, but uh, cover the area over the wounds. So you can see these, these ulcerated wounds here that are, don't look like they have any chance of healing by themselves. Um, shockwave is applied directly over them. And I would do it in a circular motion, constantly moving over that wound. Remember not to move side to side over the edges so that you might peel them back. You want to make sure that you're pushing in a little bit and you're going around and you're kind of almost pushing it together a little bit. Okay. And you want to stimulate the edges of that wound and in the center. But you really got to get the edges stimulated because that's where it's going to start to come together. All right. And I would do it in doses. I would do two or three, four or 500 shocks, have a break. Reapply, reapply 2000 shocks per, as long as that patient is not in too much discomfort, but 2000 per site is, is pretty legitimate way of doing it. Okay. I think that that would be about appropriate in most cases. Sometimes it's a thousand because the patient's a bit sensitive and they can't handle much more than that. 
okay? But don't forget that the effects of this will happen in the coming days. Most often it's not then and there, okay? So here's some of the research on that. So some, from the experiments done in this first paper, it's possible to conclude that shockwave would improve not only the wound healing process, but also the regeneration events. Now, some of these papers there, they're not really committed to saying it's the best thing ever. They're not committed yet. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's not being used successfully clinically everywhere, because it certainly is. Um, that's my experience of talking to other clinicians. People are finding it incredibly effective. Um, in this other paper, shockwave reduced wound healing time by three days for acute soft tissue injuries, um, soft tissue wounds rather, although all soft tissue injuries will have a positive effect from shockwave, and by 19 days for chronic soft tissue wounds and the risk of wound infection by 53% reduced um, when compared to conventional wound therapy alone. I think when I amended it, I... I took out the part reduced, but that's what it is. So there's a huge positive effects, no serious side effects were reported. And so it's really effective when you compare it to standard wound care. So, um, so the CWT, so standard wound care, conventional wound therapy, when you compare that to shock of shockwave wounds. Okay. Doing both is effective. And that's what people tend to do. They do the normal wound, um, wound care. The other thing I do is light therapy and LED, um, LED light therapy and laser. And it's really effective together. Okay. All right. That's wounds. I've got eight minutes. So let's talk about the hand and wrist. And uh, I might run a little early. We'll see how we go. Only a few minutes. All right, Decurvanes. Uh, Decurvanes is a wrist thumb condition where a person has pain generally somewhere around here, the anatomical snuff box region. And it's often to do with gripping or any kind of action of the thumb, twisting, things like that. It, it tends to affect people in everyday actions that they need their hand for. Even cutting, they'll feel it. Cutting like in the kitchen. The thumb tends to hurt if you do this Finkelstein test where you flex it and, and stretch it out. And it can even hurt with active resistance extension of the thumb. Hurts over the tendons and there's some swelling often. Ducurvanes is a tenosynovitis, so it affects the synovial tissue over the tendon. And it therefore makes it an inflammatory type condition rather than purely degenerative or not, not degenerative at all. Some say it's not even really tendinopathy or a tendon problem at all. It's synovial over it rather than actually tendon. And this is generally true. It's an inflammatory condition over these um, synovial sheaths. So shockwave is anti-inflammatory. Shockwave also de increases blood flow. These are both very, very positive effects for decurvanes and there are very minimal treatments that were for decurvanes and often people are in hand splints. Uh, laser works, but not always. Uh, in fact, shockwave is far more consistent than laser. Sometimes you have osteophytes over this end of the radius, the styloid process of the radius, and they could be involved. They could be causing friction. If that's the case, you want to shockwave those osteophytes and you wouldn't know that they're there unless they had an x-ray MRI. So make sure they've had a scan for the curvanes before you start doing heaps and heaps of treatment. You know, you might do it after the first visit, but then before you start doing five, six treatments, um, get a scan and then get one after if you, if you want. Uh, but the main thing is to get them out of pain and get them in full function. So this is a very temperamental condition and often doesn't respond early needs multiple sessions sometimes I've, I've listed eight but sometimes it's more as long as it takes as long as it's improving over time and some patients who have very bad lifestyles and poor diet uh smokers drinkers they don't tend to get that better quickly in fact some of them i i have to have some pretty harsh words about how they live 
Because with an inflammatory type condition like this, everything that drives up inflammation is in play. Okay. So if you're not improving their condition, start looking elsewhere. You know, what other things are involved in their inflammation levels? Okay. Uh, but coming back to this, direct it straight over the side of pain. Often you have to do little circles over it with the shockwave and you have to move up and down, not staying at one point. Often it's way too painful. This is a very painful condition. So in this study, they found that shockwave therapy is safe and an easy method to reduce pain and enhance upper extremity function and ham grip strength, like I mentioned, in patients with Ducurvain's tenosynovitis. And uh, that's study from uh, January, 2021. Um, that's a good one. Um, it's a clinical trial. And I find that these, these studies that are done, some of them have reasonable numbers of people. I can't remember how many are in this paper, but we're yet to find with these sort of more intricate conditions, such as tenosynovitis, that we have huge numbers in those cases. I think it's very hard to recruit that many people with it because it's not that common. If it was lower back pain, you'd get a much bigger cohort. But de Curvain's is just, you just can't get large cohorts for those studies. So don't expect it, okay? Um, nonetheless, any kind of tenosynovitis, tendinopathy, you can apply the shockwave directly over the site of lesion and over the site of the pain, okay? And apply it in a range of about two to 4,000 shocks with always that first session going less within their painful limits within pain limits, so not into that much pain, like, ah, ah, it hurts, hurts, stop. Ah, it hurts a bit, but yep, I can handle it. That's about what you want them to say, okay? So if they're feeling like, I can manage it, it's fine. And you've done 500 shocks and they go, mm, not getting worse, grip, 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 uh, or it's getting better, great. But if it's like, oh, it's getting worse, it's gotta stop. Shockwave is not the therapy for them, at least not in the way that you're doing it. Start thinking about what nerves run through there, Okay, so often the musculocutaneous nerve and the radial nerve around there are in play and uh, they have entrapment sites all through the upper extremity. All right, um, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, same rules apply. You want to apply it over the forearm where I know the carpal tunnel is not there, but the nerve entrapment sites are higher up, right? So those areas are very important to look at. I've listed them here. One, two, three. The main one is over the pronator teres. You're going to get the most result out of that. But shockwave through that carpal tunnel, okay, probably about 1,000, 2,000 shocks there. Most of the time, they can handle quite a lot of intensity. Um, it's not that painful over the area, um, but uh, only go within the limits, like I said, and then work your way up into the forearm somewhere about here, right? And use this as a chart, and you can shockwave all the way through that median nerve pathway. That's where the results are not really even at the carpal tunnel. It's actually in the forearm. I, I bet you next time you get a carpal tunnel patient that it's mostly forearm that's, pain, that's going to get the result. There'll always be cases where it's mostly carpal tunnel, but that's not my experience. Okay. I'll have to move on. So we have to talk about the case for getting shockwave. Uh, these are the different applicators. I'll weekly talk about them. The Atlas applicator is a specialized applicator for the upper cervical spine and more delicate regions like the TMJ. The deep impact applicator is a narrower head compared to the D actor. But the good thing about it is that I use it when the D actor is just not getting the job done over things like tendinopathy or calcifications. So it's like a step up, gets it a bit more focal. Very useful. The spinal kit is the angled like that and it's used to increase mobility over a segment or even the soft tissues um, can be released over there as well so that's very useful for when you want to apply uh, a bilateral approach over the spine the fascia kit is very useful because the the applicators in there are different shapes and you use them like you would iastm or any kind of um, hand fascial release they are exceptionally effective I've used them over fascial dysfunction in a region and I found range of motion increases after one, I go from one point to another, the result is immediate and you don't need to do too many. Often it's like three times through it with a fascial glide. I take the skin slack up. Great. Very good um, applicator, the fascial kit. Particularly if you like working with fascia. 
Um, so uh, the outcomes are faster. The outcomes are more regular. Yeah, good outcomes. And the expectation that you will get a good result, you can have confidence and more confidence that it will occur. It's great to have so much confidence in what you do. Not arrogance, confidence, because it's not always going to work and you've got to be aware of that, right? Like anything, but it will work more often. That's my experience. I've been using it for a long time now and I cannot work without it. It's a very different experience working in clinic without this device. You know, um, the return on investment is very obvious to me, okay? Not only can you make your consultations a premium consultation because you're using Shockwave, so therefore you can increase your prices. And that will depend on where you work, you know, what suburb you work, the social, um, the demographic there, socioeconomic demographics, things like that. Uh, so it might be lower in one suburb, higher, a suburb and higher another. Uh, and you can also shorten your treatment. So I've found that I can do short treatments that are last 10 minutes, 15, 20, when it would normally have taken 45, right? So often it's, it makes the treatment half the length. And then you can increase patient numbers. If you find that you only work for a certain amount of hours and you shorten your visits because the results there already, you don't need to keep going for no good reason, uh, then you can add in more patients. I mean, it's, it's basic math, but it also means that you can charge more. There's more money in that. And uh, that price, well, you know, consider how you advertise yourself, right? So if you talk about what Shockwave does, you've got plenty of research you can take from and talk about in your um, social media or on your website. You can um, get more referrals because your patients will start talking. They're like, this guy had Shockwave. He got rid of it within, you know, very minimal sessions. You've really got to try it. And it's got a novelty around it like that. So people will want to start coming more regularly and they'll um, refer people more often. And that's my experience. So you can, if you prefer, I use shock over everything. So my consultation fees are always the same. But if you want to charge a, like a fee on top of your consult, you can do that to basically say, all right, we're going to use shock wave today. That'll be X fee on top. Okay. That's another way of doing it. People do that with other therapies. Uh, as a standalone, you can, you know, re obviously reduce short, you know, shorten your treatment times and charge more. Um, you can also do packages, you know, this many treatments for this much. I have done that in the past, um, but I find that it's very hard to predict how long things will take to, to treat. And sometimes around health funds, it's a bit tricky with getting <coughs> rebates adequate per session. So those big packages don't always work for people who, who have rebates. But pick a structure for you. I just raised my prices and kept my sessions to a shorter length and that worked for me. Um, so chronic conditions are very, it's very effective on chronic conditions. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious because it, it engages a healing response and a blood flow response that you're just not going to get from other therapies, right? So conditions that are a bit sluggish to change, they start changing. And, uh, you know, if you use shockwave, take photos of shockwave, it's a very um, interesting looking therapy and people are very interested once you have videos of you doing it. Um, if you go online, you see videos of shockwave. It, people are, they're interested. Everyone calls it the jackhammer in my uh, clinic, <laughs> even before I even tell them that other people call it that. They just always say the jackhammer and that, that goes around town. Everyone's like talking, I go see Emerus because he's got the jackhammer. And they're like, what's that? They're like, I don't know, but it's great in our patients talk. So um, you do get that with laser, but nowhere near as much as shockwave. Like this just, it's a, uh, it's an easy sell. Okay. All right. Time for some questions. Hey, um, it's just that I'll only be there for a couple of days, a fortnight. So if I can oh, only I see, what see you mean. once or twice okay. in that time, and then it's another week break. Oh, oh that's fine. More. That's fine. Yeah. Absolutely fine. Yep. Yeah. I've had patients have two-week breaks 
And as much as I don't like it, it overall often doesn't matter. It just takes longer. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. What are the contraindications to shockwave? Well, you know, radial shockwave has very minimal. Um, you would think over open wounds, right? But turns out, particularly if you cover them, uh, not so. Uh, whereas focal shockwave has many, okay? Um, obviously, shockwave over obvious points like the eye <laughs> or the teeth. You know, don't be... Don't go to areas where you can cause real damage, okay? I don't tend to do it on the top of the head, um, mostly because it's very bothersome. Um, over this area, fine. This area, fine, okay? Um, what about the application to QLs under the... Uh, so there's a lot of um, stuff about shockwave being dangerous to the lungs or any kind of organ, right? I mean, you, I, use I use shockwave on abdominal scarring where I apply, I apply shockwave into the abdomen over the intestines where there's like adhesion buildup and it's a very successful approach. But there, the way that you approach it, you're far more likely to cause trauma to the bowel sticking your fingers into for a psoas release than used with a shockwave. I can tell you now. Yeah. So applying it under the QL, into the QL under the 12th rib, uh, I do it all the time, but I I'm, I'm tend to be treating a nerve there and not the QL. Um, and there's no coughing response to it. So they're not initiating a, it's not really being that vibrated, you know. If it was, you'd be getting coughing. So that's my answer to that. I think my experience with that is it is safe and I've never seen any adverse effects from it. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, how do I explain to patients in layman terms, what does shockwave do? Okay, Chris. <clears throat> if it's a tendinopathy in layman's terms, it just initiates a healing response. Right. Obviously, it's more complicated than that, but you for a, a tissue that's not responsive, it's not healing fast enough or at all, you want to make sure that the body is engaging the healing response through an inf inflammatory response that then becomes an anabolic reparative response. And that's what Shockwave does by engaging repair enzymes and increasing blood flow. And if it's to do with adhesions, well, it can decrease adhesions. You know, that's, that's very obvious. The shockwave shakes things loose, in essence. That's how I explain it. They're the two often ones like you're a tissue that's stuck, sticking to something like a nerve sticking to a soft tissue or a tendinopathy, or if it's bone, it's literally, we're breaking down the bone that's calcified. Very obvious, yeah. Pretty simple like that. That's how it, I wouldn't, use more than that many words in one go. What do you actually use? Oh, I use the Gymna um, and I have a few different applicators. I predominantly use the D-Actor. Uh, I get used to it and like, I tend to amend everything to suit it, if that makes sense. Um, but I do have all the different other applicators, but I tend to use it the most and also the Atlas. Um, yeah, so the Gymna is fantastic. Uh, I've used it a very long time. I have the new... Um, handpiece which is phenomenal um far more efficient than the old one and uh the the new software allows for you to go lower in the bar so that means you can you can treat patients when some patients where you couldn't with one bar so you can do 0 0.3 or 0 0.5 bar or whatever it might be and uh start treatment and then slowly build up in intensity yeah any other questions um but yeah look the gym is fantastic I, like i said can't rave about it anymore um no problems with it, so easy to use. And uh, um, I don't know how I'd go changing it up now. <laughs> I'm not good for change with devices like that. But um, yeah, no, I'm, I've been using it for a while now and um, it's really, it's very user-friendly, let's put it that way, okay? Any other questions? I don't think there is.
Alrighty, everybody. Thank you so much for your time tonight. And Emrys, thank you so much for that. I know I learned a lot and I hope everyone did as well.